Thanks for joining us and welcome to the Hoff Center webinar speaker series, Hoppy Topics. My name is Darren and I am part of the success team here at Hofsteiner. The Hofsteiner webinar speaker series, Hoppy Topics, is a free online educational seminar with presentations from our lead researchers and hop scientists. Each presentation was created to address hop related challenges brewers face on a daily basis while unraveling the blurry mysteries behind hoppy brewing. We hope their latest discoveries help you in your quest to brew better beer. I will host a new speaker with me here every Tuesday throughout the months of May and June to keep you up to date on industry trends and helpful insights. Under current stay at home orders, we hope these presentations help bring supportive inspiration to your lives and your craft. Before I introduce you to our guest speaker, everyone should know that comments and questions are absolutely welcome. Each will be addressed at the end of the webinar using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. Also, if there is a hoppy topic our speaker series did not address, shoot us a comment or suggestion. We'd love to hear from you. A link with each webinar recording will be available on our website under the online customer portal page shortly after each presentation. Simply sign up on our website to watch or download. And without further ado, here with us today is Dr. John Paul May. Technical Director of Product Development at Hopsteiner, along with our questions moderator, Mike Sutton, Vice President of Craft Sales. Dr. May started his work as a hop chemist in 1993 and has since developed numerous patent hop related products throughout the brewing industry today. Some of, my, some of Dr. May's latest work focuses on dry hopping and its effects on bitterness, a to topic Dr. May is looking forward to talking with us today. Dr. May, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Darren. With that, uh, why don't we get started again? Uh, today's talk is about uh, dry hopping and its effect on beer bitterness, the IBU test, foam, and pH. What we're going to talk about first are the hop acids and hops. And these are the major hop acids as well as the minor hop acids. And it's actually the minor hop acids <clears throat> which really triggered my interest in all of this work that uh, you'll be uh, seeing today. Um, we'll talk about the two uh, main instruments that we use uh, in the hop industry, and that is uh, UV spectrophotometric analysis and high performance uh, liquid chromatography. We'll then talk about humulinomes, uh, what they are, why they're important, and uh, we'll look at their concentration in baled hops and hop pellets and dry hop beers. And then what we'll do is we'll go through a series of dry hopping experiments to see what the effects of dry hopping is on beer bitterness, uh, the IBU test, beer foam, and pH. <clears throat> I think most people are familiar with the two major uh, organic acids in hops, uh, the alpha acids and the beta acids. Uh, depending on the hop variety, you can have alpha acids at concentrations very low, around 2%. And then you can have other varieties like Apollo where you have a alpha concentration as high as 20%. Um, hops are typically not bred for beta acids. So as a result, uh, the concentration of beta acids is generally on the lower side, about two to 8%, again, depending on the variety. <clears throat> In North America, the concentration of alpha acids and beta acids is typically measured by spectrophotometric analysis. The way the UV spectro uh, test method works is you take about five grams of freshly ground hops, uh, you extract it with 100 milliliters of toluene, uh, you then take one mil, milliliter of that toluene and dilute it to 500 mils with alkaline methanol, and then you uh, put it into a, a cuvette like this. Uh, you then have a light source, which goes through a monochromator, which splits the light into individual wavelengths. And as those individual wavelengths pass through your sample, it'll produce a spectrum, and that spectrum uh, looks kind of like this. So this is the UV spectra of pure alpha acids, and this one is of pure beta acids. And as you can see here, alpha has a nice absorbance at around 325 nanometers, whereas with beta acids, about 355 uh, nanometers. So this is a uh, UV spectra of some Cascade hop pellets, and so, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, some smart analytical chemists came up with these uh, kind of complex formulas, but it's really pretty simple. You just, as I said, 
you uh, look at the absorbance uh, maximum at 355 and then at 325 and at 275 and then you plug it into this formula and voila, you can uh, know what the concentration of alpha acids is uh, in your hop samples. And then you can use the second formula here to measure the uh, beta acid concentration in the hops. Another nice thing about the uh, UV spectro test method is uh, you can also look at the absorbance at 275 nanometers and divide it by the absorbance of 325 nanometers. And what that'll give you is uh, what we call the HSI or the hop storage index. And that'll tell you, let's say, the degree of freshness of your hops, or, or you can call it the degree of oxidation uh, of your hops. And so typically, uh, if you have an HSI value of about 0.2 to 0.25, that means these hops are very, very fresh. That means when they were picked and dried and, 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 and put into bales and, and pelleted, uh, they were done under extremely good conditions. Um, even at uh, 0.25 to 0.3, uh, the hops are, again, extremely fresh and uh, very good quality. Uh, then as you start to go a little higher, 0.3 to 0.4, the hops are getting to be slightly oxidized. Now, uh, some brewers, depending on where they're using their hops, if they're using it for aroma uh, or dry hopping, they actually may want the hops with a slightly, let's say, oxidized amount of uh, hop oils. All right, and but then when you get to about 0.4% or higher, uh, then the hops are usually a little bit overdone and uh, could cause problems in the brewing process. It should be noted though that there are certain hop varieties that are just naturally higher in HSI versus other varieties. So just because a hop variety might be around 0.3 to 0.35 uh, doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, unacceptable. Uh, it, it could be that it's just, that's where its normal range is. Another instrument that's used uh, to measure the concentration of hop acids in hops is uh, an HPLC. This is what one can uh, look like. Uh, the way the HPLC operates is you have a solvent, which we call a mobile phase. It goes through a pump, and then uh, that pump will push the solvent uh, through this tube, and then you have an injection point here. And at this injection point, you can inject your extract of hops that you just extracted. And you can even, believe it or not, just even uh, uh, put in a sample of beer. And so anyways, the mobile phase will push your uh, sample uh, through this special column called an HPLC column. It has special packing material which separate the various hop acids uh, based on their polarity. And so if everything goes well, all the hop acids get separated as they leave the column. They go through a UV detector and then you get a bunch of peaks, which can be measured in a computer. So for an example, uh, you can separate the various alpha acids uh, using an HPLC. Now, most people are familiar with the co, n, and add forms of alpha acids, okay? But there's also a post-humulone, all right, which we only have an ethyl group, and then we have a pre-humulone, which has an isopentyl group, so. They're very, very tiny. Most hops contain 0.2% of these uh, organic acid, alpha acids, if not less, uh, but you can see them and measure them uh, using uh, HPLC. The same is true for beta acids. Uh, again, we generally only refer to the beta acids as the co -N and add, but there is a post-lupulone and a pre-lupulone, but they're found in even smaller concentrations uh, in, in hops. Than, uh, than what you might find in alpha acids. So they're very tiny. So people often ask me, so which test method is better or more accurate? Is it UV spectro or is it HPLC? And it, uh, it really depends on what you're looking for. UV spectro and HPLC, the results are generally very similar. Uh, you usually will have higher numbers for the alpha acids uh, and the beta acids. Uh, by UV spectro than HPLC, but this is primarily because the UV spectro will measure those pre and post humulinones, whereas with HPLC, we're generally just measuring the co-N and add. Another thing that the UV spectro can measure uh, is the uh, some of these uh, 
uh, uh, minor hop acids which contribute bitterness. And that's what I wanna talk about next. So when I talk about minor hop acids, I'm talking about the oxidized uh, alpha acids known as humulinones, okay? And the oxidized beta acids uh, called hulipones, okay? Now these, uh, uh, most hops uh, in a bale form might contain about 0.1% to maybe 0.2%, but then as the hops get pelletized, uh, they can increase a little bit. Um, and so, uh, Again, these concentrations are too small to be measured accurately or at all by uh, UV spectro, but they're not too small to be measured by HPLC. So a few years ago, um, we were measuring some baled hops at our pelleting plant at, by HPLC. And uh, after the hops were pelleted, uh, when we ended up measuring the uh, hop pellets uh, by HPLC from that same lot of baled hops, we noticed that the humulinone peaks looked a little bit bigger in the pelletized form of the hop. When we reanalyzed those pellets the following day, we noticed that the peaks were, were getting even a little bit bigger than that. So what we decided to do was uh, perform a study to see what was going on here. But in order to uh, accurately measure the humulinone formation, uh, we needed an HPLC calibration standard. When you're using and operating an HPLC, you need a standard to calibrate the instrument. Well, there was no humulinone HPLC calibration standard uh, available, so we made one. And so what we did is we checked the literature and we found that if you uh, take some purified alpha acids and treat it with hydrogen peroxide, you can oxidize the alpha acids to make humulinones. And so uh, we were able to do that. And then one of the tricks in the hop standards industry, if you call it that, is to treat a uh, hop acid, in this case humulinone, with a uh, organic base um, like dicyclohexylamine. And then what you end up forming is an organic salt. And so this organic salt can be recrystallized and a solvent like acetone. They get very, very pure crystals. Uh, we dried the crystals and uh, sent them out for elemental analysis. And the analysis showed it contained 64.5% humulinone. So we were able to uh, calibrate our HPLC using this standard. <clears throat> uh, just so you know, our laboratory uh, produced a couple hundred uh, grams of this dicyclohexylamine humulinone HPLC calibration standard. And if you're interested in purchasing this standard, you can uh, go on the ASBC webpage, the American Society of Brewing Chemists webpage, and you can uh, actually uh, purchase uh, these standards. So what we did <clears throat> is um, we took some baled hops from the Zeus variety and uh, we uh, pelleted them and immediately put them in a vacuum foil uh, container, all right? And uh, we stored one set at 22 degrees centigrade and another set at nine degrees centigrade. And over the course of uh, several days, uh, we measured the humulinone concentration in those pellets. And what we found was that, you know, over time we got to a certain concentration and then it kind of stopped, okay? And it seemed like this uh, humulinone formation even happens cold, although it's a little bit uh, slower, okay? So we know that when you pelletize hops, there's something in the leaf material um, that causes the alpha acids to oxidize and form humulinones. We know in baled hops, about maybe 15 to 20% of the lupulin gland can be broken. And so we believe what's happening is when those lupulin glands are broken, when you baled hops, you do form an initial amount okay, of humulinones, okay. Uh, but then once that all the lupulin glands are broken from pelleting, you can form some more. Now this might be kind of a, a high extreme. We usually see uh, humulinone concentrations usually below 0.3, but for the case of this uh, test, we wanted to use uh, a variety which, or not a variety, but of a, a lot that we knew would cause some higher levels of humulinones. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, in this experiment, we wanted to look at um, hop varieties with different HSIs. I mentioned before, the higher the HSI, um, the more, let's say, oxidized the hops are. Well, even these hops aren't very oxidized. You know, you've got an HSI pretty low of, uh, you know, 0.27, and then you got this one, 0.3. Point. So, and so again, as what you can see here is the higher the HSI, the higher amount of humulinones uh, that form in the hops uh, once the hops are uh, baled and pelleted. Well, what we wanted to do here <clears throat> is uh, look at uh, four different hop varieties with varying concentrations or, or various uh, amounts of HSI, so different lots with different HSIs of one variety. And uh, what we found here is that uh, the humulinone concentration, again, does increase uh, with the increase in HSI. And what's kind of interesting, it, it almost appears to seem somewhat uh, linear, but it's linear and a variety dependent. So you can have hops with the same HSI, but um, the amount of humulinones could be different. So, uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, so unfortunately, if you know the HSI concentration of your hop, you can't determine what the humulinone concentration is. And uh, we didn't take, uh, we haven't looked at different crop years to see if this trend holds, but, um, but we do know that um, given the same lot crop year and different HSIs of, different, of these varieties, um, it does appear to look somewhat linear. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we perform HPLC analysis not only on hops, but we do it on beer. And this is where a lot of this work actually all got started. We started noticing in a lot of these uh, commercial uh, beers labeled a a IPA that they contained uh, quite a bit of uh, humulinones in uh, the beer. We analyzed over 30 uh, commercial IPAs and found that the humulinone concentration ranged from about 3 ppm uh, to 33 ppm. And so uh, this got us thinking, you know, how much are these humulinones dissolving into the beer when one dry hops? So uh, why are humulinones important? Well, if you have 33 ppm in your beer, it could be affecting uh, your flavor or, and your bitterness. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, humulinones are formed when the alpha acids oxidize. And so again, this is the molecular structure for humulinones. And it's very, very similar in molecular structure to isoalpha acids, okay? The only difference is isoalpha acid has this hydrogen and humulinones have this hydroxy group. Hydroxy groups make the hop acid more polar. And if it's more polar, that means it should be more beer soluble or in water soluble, okay? And uh, humulones also have been reported to be about two thirds as bitter as isoalpha acids. So as kind of a, a rough rule of thumb, one ppm of isoalpha acids will uh, contribute about one IBU in organoleptic bitterness. And one ppm of humulones is about two thirds of that bitterness. So to see if the literature was correct, we took some unhopped beer. And in uh, the first one, uh, we uh, spiked uh, 20 ppm of humulinone, okay? And then uh, we spiked in another bottle of unhopped beer, uh, 13 ppm of isoalpha acids. And when we tasted the two beers, indeed our panel found that the two beers did have very similar bitterness intensity. So humulones definitely are two thirds as bitter as uh, isoalpha acids. But the one thing uh, everyone noticed was that the bitterness quality of the humulinone was very smooth and not very uh, lingering like the isoalpha acids. And so this kind of makes sense. Humulinones, having this hydroxy group means it wouldn't stick to your tongue as much. It should get washed off because it's more polar. Whereas with the isoalpha acids being more nonpolar, 
it would uh, stick uh, a little bit less to the tongue. Another interesting uh, kind of thought here is that uh, for those who don't know, we make a uh, sodium borohydride reduced isoalpha acid called Rho isoalpha acid. And Rho, like humulinones, has an extra hydroxy group. Uh, that hydroxy group is actually here. We actually reduce this uh, carbonyl group to a hydroxy group. And the Rho product also has a nice smooth bitterness and the Rho product is 0.7 times as bitter as isoalpha acids. So if you're looking for a nice smooth bitterness hop product, uh, the Rho product could be an interesting one to try. So <clears throat> in our first uh, set of dry hopping experiments, we wanted to know what the humulinone utilization is. That is, we wanted to know what percent of the humulinones in the hop pellets when we dry hop get into the beer. So we took some centennial hop pellets and we measured them uh, on the day of dry hopping and they contain 0.35% by weight humulinone. And so we took some uh, beer, all right, and we had a controlled beer, so we didn't add any hops to it. And then we dry hopped at a half a pound, a one pound and two pounds per barrel. The hops were simply dumped on top of the beer and we dry hopped two types of beer, a low IBU beer and a high IBU beer. The temperature of dry hopping was 16 degrees centigrade and the beer uh, and the hop pellets were left onto the beer for five days. So again, our two beers, uh, our low IBU beer started off with 8.6 parts per million isoalpha acid and all, the, all these measurements are HPLC and our high IBU beer uh, contained 48 parts per million isoalpha acids. Again, this was how many pounds of hops we added. We had a control and then the half pound, one pound, two pounds, and then again, control, half pound, one pound, two pounds. So after five days of dry hopping, when we measured the beers for humulinones, the control had about 0.8, the half a pound had eight ppm, the one pound, 14 ppm, and the two pound, 28 ppm. If we look at the high IBU beer, it's quite interesting. The amount of uh, humulinones was virtually the same. So what this tells us, it doesn't matter how much ISO is in the beer, the humulone concentration is just gonna go right in because it's so soluble. And if we look at the percent of the humulone that gets in, it's really quite impressive. At the half pound dose rate, it almost all goes in, 98%. At the one pound dose rate, it's about 91%. And at the two pound dose rate, it's still very high, about 88%. Another thing we looked at was uh, the effect of dry hopping on the isoalpha acid concentration. As you can see here, <clears throat> we start off with 8.6 ppm in the low IBU beer, and the iso dropped to about 7.5 ppm. So we really didn't lose uh, much isoalpha acids. However, in the high IBU beer, we lose a lot of isoalpha acids. With just a half a pound dose rate, we lose almost, uh, we lose nine ppm of isoalpha acids. And at what a one pound dose rate, we're losing almost uh, uh, 13 ppm of isoalpha acids. And here, again, uh, at a two pound dose rate, we're losing about uh, 18 uh, ppm of isoalpha acids. So we're losing a lot of iso bitterness when you dry hop a high IBU beer, but you don't lose a lot of iso bitterness when you dry hop a low IBU beer. But again, we mentioned earlier, or I mentioned earlier, that humulinones are two thirds as bitter. So that what that means is because you're adding a lot of humulinone to this low IBU beer, you can make this beer much more bitter. But with the low IB, with the high IBU beer, you're losing a lot of iso but you are gaining a lot of bitterness. So let's see what that effect will be on the bitterness of the beer. So in this experiment, what we wanted to know was how fast does human alone dry, uh, get into the beer when one dry hops, but also what else dissolves in the beer when one dry hops. So again, we uh, took some cascade hop pellets in this uh, example and uh, measured the alpha acids and the beta acids, the humulinones, the xanthohumol, and the hulipones. As you can see here, the hulipone concentration is very, very small, very small. 
Uh, and then what we did is we brewed up a uh, 45 or 54 uh, IBU all malt beer. And again, this was our dry hopping dose rate. Uh, we had zero uh, control, half pound, one pound, two pounds. Uh, the contact time was uh, one day, uh, two days, and then five days. And again, uh, the dry hop temperature was 16 degrees centigrade. Uh, the pellets were simply just dumped on top of the beer. And again, all the results are reported by HPLC. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of data here uh, on this slide, but I thought to make it look a little easier, um, I would just break out the one pound per barrel data and stick it here. So I mentioned we started off with 54 uh, ppm of ISO. And after one day, the ISO concentration dropped to 37 ppm. If you look at your uh, alpha acid uh, concentration here, okay, we start off with about eight. And then after 24 hours, we're at 21. And at the uh, humulone concentration, we're about five. And again, after uh, 24 hours, we get up to about 11. At day two, the ISO drops from uh, 37 to 32. Uh, the alpha ticks up a little bit, gets up to 31 ppm and then the humulone increases to about 15 uh, ppm. Finally, at day five, um, the ISO drops just a little bit more, um, and the alpha seems to drop a little bit, but it's kind of stabilizing here, and the humulone stabilized. In fact, we did uh, this kind of test for a, uh, with a craft brewer where, we act, where they dry hop for 10 days, and we pulled samples every single day for 10 days and analyzed them. And essentially what we found was that about two to three days, everything seems to kind of stabilize. And so whatever you get, certainly by day three, is kind of what you saw in the final beer. So, uh, so if we look at uh, the uh, detailed analysis after five days, uh, you could see here our control beer uh, by HPLC uh, contained 51 parts per million of ice alpha acids. And as we, again, increase the uh, dose rate, okay, we, we drop all the way to about 25 ppm at two pounds per barrel. So as you can see here, if we look at the percent utilization, you lose almost half of your iso alpha acid uh, when you uh, dry hop a very high IBU beer like this one uh, with two pounds of hops uh, per barrel. Uh, if we look at the alpha acids, again, it kind of goes all the way up to about 35 ppm. Uh, that's the utilization here for alpha. Again, you look at our humulinones. Again, we have very high utilizations, 100% at a half a pound, 97% at the one pound, and 90% at uh, the two pounds. We also get a fair amount of xanthohumol uh, getting into the beer. Uh, xanthohumol, for those who don't know, is a unique polyphenol that's only found uh, in hops, and it is an extremely good hydroxy radical scavenger. And hydroxy radicals are what cause beer to age and oxidize. So as a general rule, the more xanthohumol you want, you have in your beer, the, the better. Um, we didn't find any beta acids uh, in the beer. Uh, beta acids are extremely nonpolar. So uh, they're generally, you never see them in beer. And hulapones are very low in concentrations and we didn't see them in any of the dry hop beers. Those of you who uh, were around to see my New England IPA talk, uh, in that talk I mentioned how uh, the haze in New England IPAs can act as a carrier and solubilize nonpolar compounds. And so New England IPAs are about the only beer that's out there that contains uh, high concentrations of beta acids. So uh, you do find beta acids in New England IPAs, but generally uh, you don't find them in any other uh, beer. So how does this change in hop acid composition affect the beer bitterness? As you're dry hopping, the iso alpha acids are starting to go down and the humulinones are starting to go up and you're also starting to see an increase in alpha acids. So uh, as I mentioned uh, before, humulinones are two thirds as bitter as iso alpha acids and alpha acids have been reported to be about one tenth as bitter as iso alpha acids. So what we did is uh, we put together this very simple formula, which I call calculated bitterness. And so what we can do here is plug in the alpha or the iso alpha acid concentrations into here. 
as well as the humulinone concentrations as the alpha acids. And then we can get what I call our calculated bitterness. And the calculated bitterness should be more similar to what your uh, organoleptic bitterness is. So as you can see here, our control beer contains, uh, has a calculated bitterness of 55. At half a pound dose rate, the calculated bitterness drops to 51. And at a one pound dose rate, the calculated bitterness drops to 41. And at a two pound dose rate, the calculated bitterness actually starts to tick up. It goes up to 44. But this is an example of what a lot of craft brewers have mentioned to me. And that is they've noticed that when they start to dry hop their beer, sometimes the beer tastes less bitter. And this is what's happening is you're losing more of your ISO bitterness and it's being replaced by these lower, less bitter hop acids. Well, for some craft brewers, dry hopping with one or two pounds per barrel isn't enough. So we wanted to know what would happen if you go to the extreme and start dry hopping with three pounds, four pounds, or even six pounds of hops per barrel of beer. So that's what we did. In this uh, set of dry hopping experiments, we took some Cascade hop pellets, which assayed 5.7% alpha acids, 5.5% beta, 0.23% humulinones on the day of dry hopping. Again, we had a control beer, and then we dry hopped at one pound, two pounds, three, four, and then finally six pounds per barrel. Again, the hops were simply dumped on top of the beer. Uh, <clears throat> The beer we dry hopped contained 42 ppm of ice wall alpha acids. So this is our high IBU beer. Uh, the temperature of dry hopping again was 16 degrees centigrade and the contact time was three days. Now what I like about this slide here, it does a really nice job of uh, summarizing uh, what we've seen uh, in the previous two dry hopping experiments. So this blue line, this is our isoalpha acids. And again, as I, we saw before, right, when you're dry hopping a high IBU beer with one pound of hops, you can lose a considerable amount of isoalpha acids. So in this case, we lost about 13 ppm of isoalpha acids. With the second pound of hops, however, we're only losing maybe about five ppm of isoalpha acids. And then with the third pound, you know, maybe three ppm, and then it looks like maybe two ppm, and then uh, we lose about another two ppm as we go to four pounds to six pounds. So again, what this tells us is, is we are dry hopping what I call, when you're right around 20 to 25 ppm of ice alpha acids in your beer, you're now what I would call like a low IBU beer. And so you're not losing a lot of ISO, even though we're adding an additional three pounds of hops, okay? And then this uh, orange line here, this is our humulinones. Again, because humulinones are so soluble, just using that one pound per barrel, we're adding about 10 ppm of humulinone. And then that next pound, we're adding about another eight, and then about another seven and six and so on. And so we end up adding in this example here, all the way up to 48 ppm of humulinone. That's a lot of humulinone. And then the same thing here with the alpha acids, you know, uh, we can get all the way up to about 37 or so, 38 uh, ppm of alpha acids in the beer if we dry hop in this example with six. So again, if we uh, plot um, our calculated bitterness, okay, here on this scale versus the pounds of hops per barrel, again, it, it does summarize what we saw in that uh, second dry hopping experiment. And that is, we do get a loss of bitterness when that first pound of hops is added but then that bitterness starts to kind of tick up with the second pound. And then we end up actually having more bitterness in your beer with three pounds and higher. Okay. So what we decided to do in this example was run the IBUs on those six beers and plot those IBUs versus the uh, calculated bitterness. So as you can see here, for every pound of hops we add, the IBUs go up. And this is exactly what uh, craft brewers tell us. Every time I dry hop, my IBUs go up. 
But sometimes when I dry hop, my beer tastes less bitter or my beer doesn't taste anywhere as bitter as the IBUs would suggest. And that is 100% correct. And that takes us to the next section of this talk, why dry hopping affects the International Bitterness Unit Test. Now, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but the discovery of alpha acids being isomerized to form isoalpha acids, and that isoalpha acids are the actual bittering compound in beer, really wasn't uh, discovered uh, until about the 1950s uh, when Lloyd R Rigby uh, made that connection. And shortly after his uh, research was published uh, in the mid to late 50s, uh, some analytical chemists came up uh, with a test method for measuring isoalpha acids in beer. And eventually the, uh, the industry coalesced around this one test method, and this is the International Bitterness Unit Test Method, okay? And so essentially uh, what they said was, uh, for every one ppm of isoalpha acids you have in your beer, that'll measure as one IBU. And that test method, for the most part, is fairly accurate if you're brewing a beer that contains five ppm of isoalpha acids all the way up to about 35 ppm isoalpha acids. Once you go beyond those, beyond that range, either on the higher side or the lower side, then the IBU test starts to skew. Now the meth test method is actually fairly simple. It's a liquid liquid extraction. You take 10 milliliters of beer, 20 milliliters of isooctane, and you add one drop of octanol, which is essentially a defomer, and then you add one milliliter of uh, three normal uh, hydrochloric acid. And you add this to a 50 mil uh, centrifuge, and then you essentially just uh, shake it for 15 minutes. Uh, you allow the uh, layers to uh, separate, and the upper uh, isooctane layer will have extracted uh, the isoalpha acids out of the beer. And then you take that isooctane layer, you put it in your cuvette, you measure the absorbance at 275 nanometers, you multiply it by this factor of 50, and voila, you get your IBU. So that IBU will tell you how many ppm of isoalpha acids in your beer. The problem with this test method is it was designed for only beer that was kettle hopped, okay? It was not designed for beer that was dry hopped. And as we have just learned, dry hop beer contains humulinones and alpha acids and other hop compounds and these other compounds do get extracted into the isooctane and they do absorb at 275 nanometers and they then therefore inter they, they screw up the IBU test method. So to show you how, what I mean by this is uh, we have the ability at our company to isolate very pure isoalpha acids, very pure humulinones, alpha acids, and xanthohumol. And so what we did is we made 30 ppm solutions of these hype hop compounds in uh, acidic isooctane, okay? And then we ran their uh, UV spectra, okay? Uh, and this is what the individual UV spectras look like. And as you can see here, okay, this blue line, okay, so this is our isoalpha acids. And as you can see here, humulinone, as well as alpha acids also absorb at 275 nanometers, okay? And uh, Xanthohumo essentially does not. Uh, and so what we can do is we know the concentration, we know the absorbance, and therefore we can calculate what's called the response factor, okay? And that is how many ppm of hop acid uh, will absorb a certain amount. And so uh, we measured 0.7 uh, as the response factor for isoalpha acids. And if you check the literature, it, it, it is, I'm sorry, 0.7 for isoalpha acids. And if you check the literature, uh, it is 0.7. And we measured 0.6 for humulinones and 0.6 uh, for alpha acids. And again, this very tiny number here. So what this tells us is that humulinones will absorb 80% as much as isoalpha acids, but they're only two thirds as bitter. Alpha acids will also absorb 80% as much as isoalpha acids, and they're only one tenth as bitter. So when you're dry hopping beer, these 
low bitter and non bitter hop acids uh, will interfere and absorb and artificially elevate your IBU result, even though your beer won't taste anywhere as bitter as uh, what the IBU test result would indicate. So again, why the IBU does not work for dry hop beers is that the hop acids in dry hop beers like Icewolf acids, alpha acids, and humulones absorb light at 275 nanometers differently. And because each hop acid has a different bitterness intensity, you cannot correlate uh, the IBU to beer bitterness. The only way you can try to correlate the perceived bitterness is by using an HPLC and then calculating the bitterness based on the concentration of isoalpha acids, alpha acids, and humulones you have in your beer. Now, this is a very interesting uh, subject for me because uh, I would often give talks on dry hopping and uh, I would have some craft brewers say, you know, a lot of my dry hop beer has very poor foam. And I thought, oh, is that so? And then I'd talk with other craft brewers who would tell me that their dry hop beer has fantastic foam. So I was wondering what's, what's going on here? So in, in the brewing industry, uh, the Niebaum Foam Stability Tester is considered the industry standard for measuring foam in beer. Uh, the way it operates is you can take a can of beer or a bottle of beer and uh, the machine will pull out a sample, it'll put it into this flask, and then it has this uh, flasher which causes the beer to foam, and then it measures the foam collapse over 30 millimeters. And then the results are uh, reported in seconds. So the more seconds, the better. So what we did here is uh, we took a beer, uh, we measured its uh, foam, okay, uh, with the knee bond. We got about you know 290 here, and then we started to dry hop it for three days with a half a pound, one pound, two pounds per barrel. And as you can see here, um, the more hops we added. Uh, the worse the foam got. We then wanted to look at contact time. Uh, is there a difference between dry hopping over the course of one day or, or versus 18 days? And so in this case, uh, again, uh, we measured the foam and then dry hopped with one pound of uh, Cascade hop pellets over eight days. And again, we measured the foam. And again, here, the longer the contact time, the worse the foam. So there's something in the hops that's getting extracted out over time and causing this uh, reduction in beer foam. And it's probably uh, fatty acids, but anyways. But we wanted to see if perhaps um, the change in hop acid composition was responsible uh, for this uh, loss in beer foam. Because we do know that when you dry hop, you lose isoalpha acids. And we know the more isoalpha acid you have in your beer, the better the foam. So what we did here is uh, we took a controlled beer and we measured it by HPLC, it had 48 ppm iso and no alpha or humulinone. And then we dry hopped it, again, with Cascade hop pellets, uh, one pound per barrel. The iso uh, dropped to 30, uh, the alpha increased to 19, and the humulinone increased to 17. So what we did here is again, we measured our, our controlled beer uh, by Nibam, and we got about, you know, about 345 uh, seconds. And then after dry hopping with one pound per barrel, it dropped to just under uh, 310 seconds. And then what we did here is we tried to make what I call kind of like a simulated uh, dry hop beer. So we took a, uh, a non-hopped beer of this type and we added 30 ppm of isoalpha acids. And interestingly, we got better foam with 30 ppm of iso alpha acids than the dry hop beer, which also contained 30 ppm of iso plus 17 ppm of humulone and 19 ppm of alpha. So there's something other than the hop acids that are causing this foam collapse. But we wanted to see what the effect on foam was if we took that 30 ppm iso beer and added 17 ppm of humulone. And what we learned was actually something quite interesting. I mean, 17 ppm of humulone is a lot of hop acid, 
but we got very little increase in foam, all right? We only went from about 320 to about, what, 328 or so, all right? We didn't even get another 10 second increase. So what this tells us is because humulones are so more polar than isoalpha acids, um, that relates to poor foam enhancement properties of humulonone. And then what we did is we looked at the 30 ppm of uh, isoalpha acids with the addition of just 19 ppm of alpha acids, all right, because 19 was when what was in this beer. And as you can see here, we get huge bump in foam. And it actually has been reported uh, in the literature that alpha acids added to beer post-fermentation will boost the foam. So this dry hop beer in many respects should have had really good foam given all the alpha was, that was in it. So there's something other uh, than hop acids that are causing this reduction in beer foam. And uh, as I suggested, it's probably uh, the fatty acids uh, in the hops. So what can you do if you dry hop a beer and it has poor beer foam? Well, the hop industry has these foam enhancing hop products uh, like tetrahydroisoalpha acids and a very small amount, five to six ppm can be added to your dry hop beer and boost the foam quality to back to levels uh, you had before you dry hop. So there are options out there if you have a beer that has poor uh, foam when it comes to dry hopping or just regular hopping. Well, all of our research on the uh, effects of uh, dry hopping on beer foam were done with Cascade. Uh, so we wanted to look at some different varieties to see if it was standard across all varieties. And uh, to our surprise, uh, it wasn't. In fact, uh, what we found was that uh, some varieties uh, like Eureka and Apollo were actually foam positive. Uh, and this was done after uh, three days of dry hopping. Whereas Centennial and Cascade were kind of foam negative, but again, based on the temperature. Now this is one of the things about the Nibom foam test I don't like. They generally recommend that you perform the test at 20 degrees C, okay? But beer is generally poured and consumed cold. And so we wanted to measure the foam when it was cold. And as a general rule, whenever we run the Nibom test on cold beer, we always get a better result. And indeed that's the case. You know, for here for Centennial, for an example, this, to me, this tells me Centennial really doesn't affect uh, foam at all, uh, you know, because uh, you're going to pour it cold and so it, what, you're losing a couple of seconds. That's nothing when it comes to the Nibom foam test. But you do get improvement, you know, with these Eureka and Apollo varieties. But the surprising thing was with Cascade. Again, even cold, uh, this particular uh, Cascade uh, sample uh, did not uh, improve. Uh, so this could explain what some craft brewers are saying, and, and that is some of them are saying, hey, I'm getting really great foam, you know, and some are saying I'm getting really poor foam. It could be due to the variety that you're using, or it could be how long you're dry hopping for. So what we did in this last uh, foam experiment is uh, we took a hop variety like Eureka, which is foam positive, you know, after three days of dry hopping, but we wanted to see what would happen if we dry hop over the course of like seven days. So again, uh, this was our control beer. And then after you know, one day, we measured the foam, uh, two days, and then three days. And as you can see, after two days, uh, and it starts to kind of tick down a little bit, but you don't get to a point where it's actually less uh, than the control until about five days. So what this tells me is that if you're dry hopping for more than, let's say, you know, five or six or seven days, uh, there's a good chance uh, your beer may have some uh, negative uh, foam impact, all right? Whereas if you keep the dry hopping shorter to like two or three days, uh, you're probably gonna be, uh, for the most part, in good shape. But again, it could affect the, the flavor of your beer if you change the days of dry hopping. We're getting down to the end here. So this is our uh, final slide on our uh, our project here, uh, and that was the effect of dry hopping on beer pH. Uh, this is something a lot of craft brewers are familiar with. Uh, I get a lot of questions about it, and I'm like, yep, uh, we've seen this impact as well. Again, depending on the base beer, uh, you can get a change uh, 
in uh, pH uh, intensity, let's say. And so, but what we generally see is generally about an increase of about 0.1 pH units for every pound of hops you add to the beer. It's not quite linear, but it's pretty close. And so often questions I'm asked about beers that are higher in pHs with regard to their microbiological stability, because I know the FDA likes to keep things on the acidic side and craft brewers are concerned that, you know, when you get the pHs of 0.48 and higher, you know, you might be above that limit. And so uh, what I tell them is that the two types of bacteria uh, that are around are gram negative bacteria and gram positive bacteria. In about 99% of the cases, gram negative bacteria requires oxygen. Beer is an extremely low oxygen environment. So gram negative bacteria will not be able to grow in carbonated beer. Okay, gram positive bacteria. Gram positive bacteria are very sensitive to hop acids, okay? Give you an example. Alpha acids can inhibit gram positive bacteria at a concentration of two parts per million. Isoalpha acids is eight parts per million, okay? And so, and human loans, I think are reported to be about eight to 12 parts per million. So if you have a dry hop beer with something like 10, 15, 20 ppm of alpha acids, okay, which would be the case for these higher pH beers, um, you're gonna have more than enough uh, hop acid in there to inhibit the growth of gram positive bacteria. So you should be in good shape. Another question is, does this increase in pH affect bitterness? And it does, uh, and there's been some, uh, published literature that shows as you start to go up in pH, the beer can actually become slightly more bitter. And uh, what we did uh, was an experiment as we took a beer that was actually around uh, 4.9 uh, pH, and we just added some sulfuric acid to lower it to about four and a half uh, pH. Uh, and uh, we tasted the two beers and it kind of, again, it could have been the acid that we used, but uh, everyone preferred the higher pH beer versus the, the lower pH beer. But I've also seen some other uh, reports in the literature that shows that you know using different acids and, and different beers, uh, sometimes you can have a better flavor impact at lower pH, but other beers and different acids, you have a better flavor at a higher pH. And, uh, and I would say the change in bitterness uh, from the 4.8 to 4.5 was very, very subtle. You're probably looking at maybe a couple of IBUs at, at best. So in conclusion, hops contain small concentrations of humulinones and their concentration increases after pelleting and then stops. The higher the HSI in hops or hop pellets, the higher the humulinone concentration. And this relationship is variety dependent. The humulinone concentration in hops and in beer can be measured very accurately using high performance liquid chromatography. However, one does need an HPLC calibration standard and one can buy those standards, as I mentioned before, uh, through the uh, ASBC. Humulinones are more polar than isoalpha acids and are extremely soluble in beer and are reported to be about two thirds as bitter as isoalpha acids and have a smooth bitterness associated with them. Beers that are dry hopped will exp experience a change in hop acid composition. That is, <clears throat> there will be a reduction in isoalpha acids and an incorporation of humulinones and alpha acids. Dry hopping a low IBU beer, and that would be a beer with about 20 IBUs, maybe even 25, will remove very little isoalpha acids, but add low bitter humulinones and alpha acids and can make a beer more bitter. Dry hopping a high IBU beer will remove a considerable amount of isoalpha acids and can make the beer less bitter when dosing a half a pound to two pounds of hops per barrel of beer. However, due to the high solubility of humulinones, dry hopping pretty much any beer with three pounds of hops per barrel or more can make a beer more bitter. Because the IBU test method was developed to measure only isoalpha acids in beer, 
Dry hop beers that contain humulinones and alpha acids will give IBU test results that don't correlate to the perceived bitterness. That is, the sensory bitterness will be significantly lower than the IBU test result would suggest. And again, that's because dry hop beers contain humulinones and alpha acids, which will get extracted into the iso-octane layer, just like the iso-alpha acids. So because of that, HPLC can be used to accurately measure the various hop acids in dry hop beers. And by using that data, one can calculate the beer's bitterness, which should correlate more closely with the perceived bitterness of that beer. Dry hopping can reduce beer foam. However, this appears to be variety dependent. Also, extended dry hop times can reduce beer foam even further. So there are foam enhancing hop products like Tetra that can be used to enhance the foam of beers that are negatively impacted due to dry hopping. Because beta acids are extremely nonpolar, we saw little to no beta acids in any of the dry hop beers we tested and very small quantities, if any, of hulapones, because hulapones are found in very, very low concentration and hops. Finally, dry, hop, dry hopping can increase a beer's pH by about 0.1 pH units per pound of hops per barrel of beer added, and that pH can increase the beer's bitterness, but again, it, it's very minor, perhaps only a couple of IBUs. Uh, Finally, uh, whoop, we got the wrong slide here, but finally I'd like to uh, thank my colleague Bob Smith and Jeremy Leaker uh, for running all these dry hopping experiments and, and performing all these tests uh, so that uh, we could put this presentation together uh, for you today. And with that, I say thank you uh, and uh, ready for questions. Thank you, John Paul, and uh, we appreciate the excellent presentation. Uh, we're coming up close to the top of the hour. Just wanted to let people know that uh, we'll have Darren uh, do a little close out, but we will uh, do some uh, question and answer session, even if it runs past the top of the hour. Um, so let me go ahead and just throw one out here real, real quick. Uh, question, is it possible to get the HSI information on our ordered hops? Uh, the answer is yes, it's possible. Um, uh, most all the suppliers are doing spectrophotometric analysis. And as John Paul mentioned, uh, the calculation comes from those uh, results. So uh, just check with your uh, uh, particular provider and, and uh, make the request. Next question. Um, is the decline of isoalpha acid with increased dry hop real, or is it perhaps driven by noise in the data and analysis due to the increase in non isobitter compounds, uncharacterized resin fractions, and other soluble and insoluble compounds? Yeah, yeah, that's, we, good, that's a good question. We use also drop, but could be related to other compounds such as polyphenols, et cetera. Right. Right, yeah, that's a good question, and it's a, a point I forgot to mention, and that is when we performed these dry hopping experiments, um, we did actually isolate the leaf material uh, after we dry hopped, and we extracted it uh, with some ethanol, and we were able to measure isoalpha acids on that leaf material, and it was a lot. So, um, the change in ISO concentration wasn't noise by the analysis, because as you can see, in a lot of cases, we were losing as much as 50% of the uh, ISO alpha acids. And so, uh, like I said, we used HPLC to do that analysis, not uh, IBU. So uh, the HPLC is, gives very, very accurate results. Okay. Uh, question, can you speculate about how the extraction of alpha, ISO, and human alones might change dry hopping between using whole leaf hops and type 90 pellets. Right, yeah. <clears throat> One of the challenges you run into uh, with whole leaf hops, and I've heard other people mention this, 
is that um, most of the lupulin gland and whole leaf hops are still intact, okay? And because they're still intact, you don't have any humulinones inside, okay? And the humulinones only form after that lupulin gland has been broken and something in the leaf material causes that uh, alpha acid to oxidize and form humulinones. So you should see lower amounts of humulinone uh, in uh, your dry hop beer versus uh, pellets. Okay. Uh, at what point during fermentation are these dry hopping additions performed? And then second yeah. part, if all tests perform post-fermentation, how would mid-fermentation dry hopping affect the, these tests? Right. Yeah, we, we did all our dry hopping uh, after uh, fermentation was done. Um, when we ran... We, I gave a talk a couple weeks ago on New England IPA, so that's probably kind of where you're getting at. And that is if you add hops during active fermentation, what we found was that the haze uh, uh, in these New England IPAs uh, actually solubilize uh, a lot more of the alpha acid than you would see in a, like say a, a West Coast style IPA. Uh, the humulinone concentration, uh, interestingly, was a little bit lower in the New England IPAs. And again, that's probably because uh, some of those humulinones are getting uh, absorbed uh, onto the yeast and whatnot. Uh, I mean, you do have a lot of humulinones uh, in uh, New England IPAs. In fact, you have more than West Coast style IPAs, but let's say the efficiency wasn't as, as high as in the West Coast style IPAs, even though you have higher amounts. So. I hope that answers the question. More alpha uh, on the hazy beers, but if the beer wasn't hazy, uh, you might expect to see uh, less humulinones and less alpha. Okay. What is your hypothesis on why you see varietal differences on foam stability? Yeah, we, we think that's due to the fact that uh, different hop varieties have different amounts and different concentrations of various fatty acids. And so uh, we think that's uh, most likely the case. Okay, just for me, I'm, I'm going to add on to that question. Would you expect to see crop year to crop year variation with the same variety? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I'd expect that. Um, we did a lot of work looking at, uh, we actually sent quite a few hop samples out for fatty acid analysis, hoping we'd find one fatty acid that would like really stand out or, or the concentration of these really stand out. And, um, and unfortunately we really didn't see anything uh, that stood out. Um, but like I said, we do know that some varieties seem to cause it to be more than others uh, if you're doing a short dry hop time. Whereas if you're doing an extended dry hop time, I think eventually they'll all cause the foam to go negative. Okay. So if, to achieve a strong but smooth upfront bitterness that's only perceivable at the front of the tongue and the palate and doesn't linger at all, is there anything you can recommend in terms of process, hot side timing additions, dry hopping, or hop choice to achieve this? Right. Well, <clears throat> As you know, uh, a lot of the uh, people who are brewing these New England IPAs are actually putting uh, like uh, almost like a chiller on their whirlpool. And so a lot of them are not adding any hops uh, to the kettle. And uh, if they're adding hops uh, to the whirlpool, uh, it's even at lower temperatures. And their initial, I think, thinking behind doing it this way is to, uh, not boil off a lot of the hop oils to retain as much hop oil as possible. But what that also does for you is it allows minimal amount of alpha isomerization into ISO. And then if you go through and do your dry hopping, the majority of your bitterness will come from the humulinone uh, and not from iso alpha acid. And that'll be a way of, let's say, getting your nice smooth uh, bittering uh, in your beer. Um, if you don't want to add all those hops, let's say, um, another 
potential would be to use, as I mentioned, the row isoalpha acid products that you know our company and other hop companies make. And the row is known to give a nice smooth non-lingering bitterness. And for those who don't know, uh, the what we do is uh, we we take CO2 hop extract, uh, we isolate the alpha acids in our downstream hop processing plant. We isomerize the alpha into isoalpha acids, and then we treat it with sodium borohydride to reduce the carbonyl group on the iso to make rho isoalpha acids. And then we formulate that as a 30% solution of rho isoalpha acid uh, in water. And so that product is used by a lot of brewers and it can be added you know, in the brew kettle, in the whirlpool, it's already isomerized, it's already reduced. And you can add that to the beer and uh, get a nice smooth bitter tasting beer without having to add any hops or, or anything like that. So that's another option. Okay, and then subsequent question, do you get a different kind of bitterness from a 60 minute bittering addition compared to a late 10 minute addition and why? Well, you're gonna get a lot more uh, uh, alpha converted to ISO uh, when you boil for 60 minutes versus 10. So you'll see that difference. You'll, you can get you know probably as much as a 35% uh, efficiency in isomerization, whereas with a 10 minute boil, you might only get about 20 or 25% isomerized. So it would just taste less bitter and probably less aromatic. Uh, well, I, it would be more, less bitter and more aromatic and more bitter and less aromatic, so. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Well, John Paul, thank you again. Um, uh, the questions that we didn't get to, we'll uh, uh, put a written response to those, but uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. And Darren, do you have anything to wrap up? Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, uh, Mike and Dr. May. Um, that wraps it up for today's webinar and our series of poppy topics. Our next presentation will be right here at the same time next week with Frank Pfeiffer discussing the application of hop oils in beer production. Um, as always, links to each recording can be found by visiting our customer portal page on our website. If more questions or comments come up, as Mike had mentioned, um, visit our website or email us directly. Uh, once again, my name is Darren. Thanks for joining us and hoppy brewing.